Anyone who's ever struggled with a difficult class in high school often wonders, will I ever actually use this stuff after I graduate? And after graduation, students probably won't dissect a frog or need to know what E means and E equals MC squared. But one thing's for sure, they're going to need to know how to handle their money wisely, and the sooner the better. Our friends over at Living Smarter Jewish actually came out with a curriculum for high schools and schools to teach financial literacy, and that's why I'm excited about this week's episode. We went to visit Hafter, a high school in the five towns in Long Island, to talk to dozens of high school seniors about money. We sat down with Stacy Zrihan, who was an amazing episode earlier in season one, where we spoke about the power of budgeting. And we had an open conversation with the children talking about money, how they view money, what they're taught in school, what they're not taught in school. And I think it will be eye-opening. There are a variety of studies that indicate that individuals with higher levels of financial literacy make better obviously, personal finance decisions. And we're going straight to the source. We're going to the schools. So without further ado, I give you Stacy and the boys and girls at Hafter. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. Okay, hi. How are you? We've never done a live recording in front of a guest audience for those listening on the podcast are what about 10,000 people here so that's cool um, we are kosher money we have a podcast where we're trying to help Orthodox Jews with money no one really teaches that in high school and or so we think and we're gonna find out today um, but we've had about 25 episodes to date uh, the videos on YouTube have over 3 million views so someone somewhere is listening and we thought it would be kind of cool to visit a high school hear from you guys and girls about how you think of money um, how does money play a role in your life and who better to have with us than Stacy Zrihan who helps educate and, and meets with couples about personal finances it's not something that uh, people are born with knowing how to manage it and it's always interesting to have a conversation with someone who sees um, a more behind the scenes picture. Stacy, would you say that's a good reenactment of what you do? Great reenactment. I meet with a lot of non-couples too, a lot of young people. I have a lot of couples who send me their children, met with high schoolers, college students, and a lot of just finishing college. So, so happy to be here today. Okay, cool. So there's this graphic that goes around and it says nine classes that should be mandatory in high school and I'm gonna s screen them out and you tell me if they teach it here or just in any school and this is not a knock on the school it's a great school um, but just across the US and across the world these classes is not are, are not necessarily taught and for those that do not know we are in Hafter here in Cedarhurst New York a great school. First class is accounting. Is accounting taught in a high school? No. Money management. No. Taxes. No. Build and keep good credit. No. Yeah, you had that. But what is that? A fifteen-minute? Was it a fifteen-minute lesson in? in a whole semester. Okay, we got one. Uh, picking the right career. Career counseling. Nutrition? No. I got some eh. No. <laughs> Self defense? No. Time management? No. Self confidence? No. So those are nine things. I'm 36 years old right now. Those are nine classes I wish I would have learned in high school, maybe college. High school could be a little bit early, and I guess that's the first question for Stacy is that. When I approached my Rosh Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael and I said, hey, I'd love to come in and talk to the 20-something-year-olds, early 20s, late teens about money management and finances, he said it would go in one ear and out the other. So we have an opportunity here. I would say there are about 100 people in the room. Many more will be listening. What, what chance do we have to leave a lasting impression on them as it relates to money? 
Excellent question. I am not sure that at this age when people are not earning their own money and they're not spending with within certain limits, that it will have the same impact as once they start earning it on their own. It's really amazing to watch, even in my own house, um, a, a quick, really two-second story. I have a friend whose daughter called her and said she would be coming home for Shavuos, and she said, oh, I'm surprised you're not staying in the city. She goes, it's really expensive to make six meals. This is the same daughter who had brought home umpteen friends every meal for all the years she didn't have to pay for it so now once you it's your own money and you've got to work for it you feel it differently so high school is a little early but nonetheless it's great for I think everyone at this age to be exposed to certain concepts and ideas that maybe they're not hearing at home and maybe will make that lasting impression and stick in their minds so is the problem that the the, the students here are not making their own money so there's a or assuming so we'll, we'll find out some are probably side hustles and Instagram influencers, but is, is the problem that they're not making their own money so they're not able to appreciate and understand what goes into earning the dollar so spending the dollar comes a little bit easier than them? Are, are there anyone, does anyone here have a business, a side hustle, a revenue stream? I see a hand in the back. What do you do? I customize sneakers for Bat You customize sneakers for Bat How long have you been doing that? Gotcha. So, so the fact that you've done that, does what changed in your mind, what your perception about money because you're earning and putting the work in? Um, I learned how to save. So, so that's interesting, Stacy, because you have someone here, 12th grade, right? Mm -hmm. That's earning their own money, and now they're starting to save. If I am not earning my own money, I'm not even thinking about saving because I have a so-called unlimited amount of money that whenever I need it, you know, I think I can walk over to a parent and say, okay, here. So I'm not actually thinking, hey, how can I turn this money into more money down the line? Exactly. And I think um, for a lot of a lot of 12th graders, and especially a lot of 12th graders in our neighborhood and maybe some other similar neighborhoods, I think there's a little bit of an unending stream. I don't think, uh, can I ask show of hands, how many of you get a fixed allowance, even if it's a high allowance, a fixed amount of money each week or each month from your parents? We've got about six hands up, I'm related to three of them, no I'm kidding, um, there, there's, um, I think what happens a lot is that parents don't even think they're giving a lot of money and maybe they're not giving that much but it's sort of a hey I need, can I have, so there's no incentive for a 12th grader to not spend that money or to be more cautious with that money because it's coming at an open flow and I think one of the hardest things for these young people to adjust to whether it's their year in Israel or in college or thereafter is the cessation or that stopping of the unlimited flow of money, all of a sudden it's a limited amount or a fixed amount that they've now got to figure out how to spend and what to do with. Yeah, I think when, when I got married, it was uh, an eye-opener where you can't just run to your mother's pocketbook anymore and take out a 20, take out a 50. The bills start coming in and you're like, oh, wait, I, I missed that yeah. never-ending flow. And it's maybe not a lot, but you knew that you had the, the ability to tap into that. Um, let's talk about their year in Israel, right? Um, would you recommend their parents giving them a, a set amount of money? I mean, it's their first entrance into the real world. They're going to be somewhat on their own. Um, what should they be doing when they're in Israel as it relates to money, and how should they start thinking about money? I'm a big fan of allowance. I always have been. Uh, we started, my, my parents started giving us allowance when we were, I don't know, seven or eight years old, and I've started my kids also maybe even earlier. I think it's very hard for someone who's never been on a fixed allowance on that first month, and that's why I always recommend if a child or if a student has worked over a summer, it's great for them to have that amount as a backup. Those first one or two months in Israel are difficult. You have the Chagim, there's a lot of time off. Also you get to your room and all of a sudden you realize there are like missing things like drawers and you need to go out and buy them in Israel. So I think that you've got um, you've got that little bit of a, of a disconnect when you first get there but I think it is ultimately the most beneficial to everybody, the parent and the child, to really have a fixed amount where they're able to go in and say and, and teach themselves, I've 
I've got whatever the amount is, X amount of money, and if I eat out every meal every day for week one, I'm probably not going to have enough to get me through the rest of the month. And again, that's we're, we're all, we all learn from consequences, so that helps your decision-making skills when you don't think you can call up five minutes in and say, hey, I used that first $400, can I get another four, or, or so on and so forth. So that, that's really more in the debit card um, arena, right? Because if someone is to get a credit card, the conversation's a little bit different because there's no so-called limit based on the amount that they would be spending. So at some point, a month, month and a half in, half, two weeks in, there's going to be a conversation, hey, you're swiping a little bit too much. Correct. Right? Correct. I think that credit card is, um, and again, I, can I ask for a show of hands, how many of you have one of your parents' credit cards that you can use as needed? Um, we got a majority of the room, I would say, with hands up. That means even if you're on a budget or even if you've been given an allowance, you always know that you can hop to that credit card. Now, is it okay to have that in case of an emergency? Frankly, I don't think it's so necessary. You know, even you, we want to imagine the worst case scenario, a pandemic hits and your child is stuck in Israel and can't get home, which is exactly what happened to my daughter and I'm sure a lot of your siblings. Guess what? They took my credit card over the phone or we were able to do it online. Nobody got stuck because they weren't holding a physical credit card. Um, so I think it's really uh, important for these young people to start to internalize the concept of not having an unlimited source of funds. We spoke about the different classes that people um, are not learning in high school and college, and there's a yearning for it, but only after the fact. There was this meme going around where a, a student says, I'd like to learn how to do my taxes, and the school um, administrator it says, molten rock is called magma. There are things that you guys are learning that, no offense to this school or any school, that you'll never apply in your life ever, I promise. <laughs> um, we can go through what that is, but there are many things you will uh, apply. What, what do we need to do to get schools, and a lot of it, it you know, is, is home taught as well, what can we do to get more education into the schools and into the students' minds so that they are starting earlier to learn practical so I think one of the tricky pieces is that it's expected that this comes from parents, and very often it doesn't. First of all, a lot of parents, unfortunately, are not doing it correctly themselves, and so students are watching or, or young people are watching behavior that's not always so healthy at home, and they're repeating that. Um, I have a lot of clients, they just assumed that once they got married, they would take on credit card debt because that's how their parents live. And saying something to a group of 100 young people as simple as, don't ever spend money you don't don't have except maybe to buy your first home is really a, a, a message that you would think everybody would find obvious, but it's not. If you don't have it, don't spend it. Even if they leave today with only that, that's a pretty good, a yes. pretty good something in their head. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I do think that um, I do think that that's an important piece. But even programs like today are great. They're hearing it and they're they just makes them more aware and they'll ask questions. So maybe it is via seminars or you know or these these shorter programs. I think it's an excellent point. Credit card debt is terrible. So the way it works is when you have a credit card and you swipe it for a hundred dollars you're basically borrowing money from the credit card company. So at the end of the month, you have to pay $100. So you got about 30 days a lending promotion, whatever you want to look at it. You, they gave you $100, but you got to pay that back. If you don't pay that back with, within 45 days, that $100 then becomes $118 or whatever it is, depending on the rate. And then if you don't pay it back the next month, it becomes $136. And that starts to add up over time where that $100 pairs of shoes, when you come back to it, will be $250 after you paid it off. And now, Stacy, there's this new idea of buy now, pay later, where they sort of say, don't, don't think about it, right? You, you know, who here has Amazon on their phone? <laughs> Almost everyone. <Yep. laughs> um, right? Amazon, it's so easy, and we spoke about this in our other episode, it's so easy for, for people that are, grew up with, with a phone in their hand, they're tech savvy, they know how this works, where you don't even, the, 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 the companies do not even want you to think that there's money associated with a purchase. 
right? It's enjoy now, pay later. How do we educate or create habits, not only for students, but for, for parents and people, grandparents? How do we educate ourselves to be conscious that everything we do has a price attached to it? The two words that I use are aware and deliberate. If you're aware of what's going on and you're deliberate in your choices, you're already a step ahead of the game. One starting point, I'm sure that if I were to ask everybody here, and I will not, I'm sure that I if I, I, you can, I wish, I'm sure that if I would ask, how much money have you spent in the last 30, 60, 90, 180 days? probably nobody would get the answer right. And I'll go a step further, probably none of the parents would get the answer right either. Everybody lulls themselves into this belief that they're really not spending that much. I see this with clients every single day. I meet with three, four, five clients a day, and I'll go through the list and I'll say to them, today we're just guesstimating, give me a number, and then go back and check the real number. And I get texts and emails and calls all the time. Stacy, we thought we were spending $10,000 a year on clothing, we're spending twenty. Twenty thousand, Stacy. We thought we were spending three fifty a week on groceries. We're spending six fifty. People who are completely off because they don't have that that there's no cash in their pocket, so they're not seeing a dwindling amount of cash. And I think one of the first things, a very simple exercise, guess what you've spent in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then go back, whether it's on a parent's credit card or on your Amazon, and check, is that really what you spent? If it is, you're already on the right track. If you're nowhere near, doesn't mean you have to, you know, go cry. Just now, for the next 30 days, think in your mind, what is my budget and what should I be spending? And try and see if you can do that one month, two months. That's how it works. And that's a... Rabbi Horowitz, who was one of our guests, um, we asked him, so are credit cards bad? Should people not have credit cards? And he said, no, you just have to be conscious that your bill is paid up at the right time. And if it's not, you cannot use it. It's a convenience. It's not something that is a God-given right, and if it's not being used correctly, then do away with it. And there are people, I have friends, that they could afford a credit card, but they deliberately only use debit cards, right? There's this envelope system where people allot a certain amount of money every month on, on each category, and that's what they use. Um, my question here is, when, it, when you look at, you said you mentioned uh, you met, with singles, right, and couples. What, and we have singles in the room. I presume no one here is married in 12th grade, is that right? Yeah, okay, nailed it. <laughs> what should singles be on the lookout for? What are some of the struggles you see when singles come up to you in their 20s? And we wanted to do a whole episode on singles because you do have people in their 20s and 30s that have money or making money, may not necessarily be paying tuitions and they want to think about saving and investing. What's your advice to a, a, a room of singles um, as it relates to money? So I love actually meeting with young singles because they're sort of at the cusp. They're just starting their financial lives. So um, firstly, I think it's really important as a single to realize that this time can be a huge opportunity for you if you're able to save. But it's also a time of realization that not everybody's equal. Um, when you're in school, you kind of feel like, well, if this person has something, I should have something. It's important to take a look and say, well, what am I earning? What are my obligations? Do I have student loans? Do I have other things that maybe I need to consider that maybe my, my best friend doesn't need to consider? And maybe if she's going on vacation or buying clothing at a certain rate, I may not be you know, able to do that. I have seen, though, especially single young women who have taken great opportunities and taken the, 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 the opportunity to really put away tons of money. Sometimes people are living at home once they're either in school or graduate, and that money just seems to collect and collect. I met with a single young woman not so long ago from Flatbush. Um, she's 26 years old, works as a computer programmer, has $600,000 in the bank. Um, she's just saving. She's just low. She needed more help with the investing side and what to do with uh, that. Shidduch for any of the guys? I, by the way, I told her to put that right on her shidduch resume. Right. She'll be gone in 30 seconds. Right. Because it's really an amazing concept when you are at that young stage. And I just want to caveat what you said about the credit card a teeny bit. Anyone who has debt 
should not use a credit card. If you've ever spent money you don't have, and people do make the mistake, and it's not the end of the world, you can get out of it, don't use the credit cards. That should really be for people who are in great financial standing and who are spending what they're anticipating each month and not going over on a consistent basis. We'll be right back to that incredible episode. But first, we want to tell you about something special. Shmuel Shiowitz, he's been in the mortgage business since the age of 18 years old. Do you know how old he is now? 20 plus years later, maybe 25 Nice. So maybe in his forties. A lot of that's that's a lot of years to be in one industry. Yeah. So Google his name. I googled his name this week. That's mm. not weird. And I clicked on news, and he is in pretty much every publication when it comes to mortgage related um, stories. They reach out to him for quotes and what he's seeing in the market. And we're in a crazy market right now in uh, the Tell summer me about summer it. of twenty twenty two. Interest rates are sky high. And he has his finger on the pulse. And we got approached by a few mortgage places. Correct. Um, Not that they weren't good, but we liked how great Shmuel was, and that's why we partnered with him. Yeah, he produces content. He's interesting. um, Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Just a good dude. Good dude in the space. Um, Check him out. If you're in the space for, um, or in the market for a space, Hmm. Approvedfunding.com slash mortgages. Probably. Any anything to do with more I was talking to him on the phone because yeah. we're you know, because I'm trying to buy a house, but he he does like you said, anything to do with space. Taking up space, whether if you have a question about a building or this or that, reach out to him. He's such a good resource. How are home prices high? They are not the best. <laughs> Can Shmuel help you with that? <laughs> he, if there's anyone who could, it's him. So right. there we go. Okay, someone actually reached out, said they need a mortgage broker. I sent them that way. Um, tell Shmuel we say hi. And I think, sorry, I interrupted before when you were saying where to find him. Approvedfunding.com slash mortgages. He's on LinkedIn. You can message him there. And now back to this week's episode. Let's educate the audience about the magic of compounding. Right? Can you explain to them what that is and why they should invest in that early on? Okay, absolutely. This is definitely my favorite concept of all. I love watching somebody's face when I when I show them on the computer screen during our meeting what money might look like in a number of years. The best thing that you have going for you right now is the fact that you're young. When you get to be Ellie's age, it's not as powerful. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait, I was going to insult myself more. Oh, okay, when you yeah, get to yeah, be go, my go on, age, it's on. like it's never too late to start saving, but money saved earlier has this incredible power. Why? There is a concept called compounding interest. I I often explain it with a snowball running down a hill. The first time the snowball goes down the hill, it it gets bigger by this much. But by the third and fourth time that it goes down, it's no longer growing at the rate of the original snowball. It's now growing this big because it's got a layer upon a layer. So compounding interest is very simply, if you put away $1,000 and it earns 10%, at the end of year one, you now have $1,100. Your original thousand is not what earns 10% in the next year, it's now the 1100. So the gains are also growing. If I take, and I show this to young people all the time, if you are 21 years old and you put money into a retirement account or into any savings account for that matter, and it earns 10% a year until you retire at age 67, from an original amount of $6,000, you will have close to a million dollars. That's never adding to it. I sit, I do this with couples, $12,000, they're over a million. And it's a crazy concept. What does that mean? If I put $6,000 away one time, I'm going to have enough, not enough to retire, but all of this money when I retire? Exactly. When you do it at age, I have clients who come to me 55 years old, and they say, we'd like to start saving for retirement. They should, and it's important, they're gonna need to put hundreds of thousands of dollars away in order for it to grow to enough money by the time they retire. You do that when you're young, you're golden. Wanna buy a house? Put away money when you're 18, 19, 20. 
The compound interest, it's growing, it's growing, and I have seen it. I see people who all of a sudden, I have, I have clients, I had a client last week who said to, we said, oh, how much do you have in a retirement? They weren't even sure they had retirement. They took a look, and their money is just growing because it was sitting there. They weren't even paying attention while they were sleeping. So it's a really powerful tool, and the fact that you're this young, the earlier you save, it just, it has a, a huge power. I want to add a caveat. Can you explain how important it is to ensure that the money is placed into an account that can grow, right? If someone makes $1,000 and puts it into a regular checking account and they come back in five years and notice that their $1,000 is now $1,001 and they're saying, hey, well, what do you mean? I met with Stacy in May of 2022 and she said it would be $10,000 right now. What, what is it that people have to be conscious about, about where they're putting the money that they're saving? The assumption is, is that that money is invested. Now, invested is a very big, open, broad topic. I'm not an investment advisor. I don't play one on podcasts. However, even if you just put your money behind the U.S. stock market and you do something as simple as investing in mutual funds or in the S&P, the S&P is what has grown 10 to 12 percent on average over 30 30 years. So everyone's always looking to beat the market. I guarantee you if you play the market and just put your money into solid, large growing companies, diversified, meaning not in all in one basket, but in different baskets, your money will grow. Will it grow every month? We all know it won't. Anyone who's turned on a TV in the last four months knows that the stock market does not grow incrementally in order. It goes up, it goes down, but over 30 years, it's pretty safe to say that our economy has continued to grow, and, and I would assume would continue to do so. If not, we all have a big problem, but assuming that that would be the case, you can't just put the money under your mattress. It does not grow under there. It would need to be invested in some, in some form. Is this resonating with you guys and girls? Is this foreign to you um, by a show of hands? And, and we can get you on the mic. But when you hear this, and it's not a knock, but I'm curious, you hear about money, you're like, yeah, okay, okay, Stacy, I'm gonna go to Israel in September. I'll be just fine. I, I have the money, I'm able to do this. You're talking about something in 30 years from now, 40 years from now, it's so far, far along. Is this something that is resonating with you as we say it? Um, this is resonating with me a lot. I like tutor a lot, and um, like I've done like different jobs in the summers, so I don't know where to put my money. I just save it, so it's like been growing over time, just because accumulating. But I don't know where to put it, so it's helpful for me to understand that I should be proactive about putting it somewhere, so otherwise it's just sitting. Exactly. And, so. Let's, let's assume Devorah is your niece, which she may be. <laughs> Stacy is related to about half the room. But <laughs> Sounds like we're in Alabama. Right. Um, no, Stacy has like 40 siblings. So, um, What would you recommend to someone, and we have to clarify and, and, and emphasize that this is not financial advice, but if you were meeting with someone that was looking to be smart, there's no guarantees in life, what would you recommend to someone that has... Uh, a stream of money coming in over time that is, how old are you, Devorah? I'm 18. 18 years old, and she wants to look back in 10, 20, 30 years and say, okay, I did the right thing. What, what practical things can um, these guys and girls, and, and I'm hoping many high schoolers and college students listen to this episode, what do you recommend they, they practically do? They're going to leave the room. What should they do? So I, my clients tend to fall into three groups. Group number one, which tend to be male, are the group that are very confident in investing. They've got this, they've studied, they've looked at it, or they've spoken about it with friends, and they feel very comfortable to invest on their own. And with the right guidance, that's not a bad, a bad way to go. Second group of people are people who are completely not interested, not understanding, have no idea how to invest. It's foreign to them. The thought of even investing or having to look it up makes them actually anxious. And then the third group are people who maybe understand a little, but they need the confidence of someone to help them. 
Um, so if you're in group one and you really kind of have a feel for this, and, and some young people do, and that's great. I would encourage that. Um, definitely read up on it. There are some more basic things like Dave Ramsey's allocations that you can read up on. You can speak to, um, pick out somebody in your world, a parent, a sibling, who you feel is doing well with money because they're handling it well, they're saving well. You can kind of get a feel sometimes when, you, when you're close to someone. Speak to them. Find out where their money is. And again, go with some of the basics, but that's an okay strategy to, to go that on your own. If you are somebody who has no idea, there's no shame in hiring a financial advisor and hiring somebody who will charge you 1% of your money, who will explain what they're doing and why they're doing it, and who will manage your money for you. Um, I think a lot of the reasons that teachers, uh, let's call it government workers, people who have retirement plans through work end up becoming millionaires is because they're not savvy, but a little bit of their paycheck is coming off every month, and someone else is taking care of it. And when they wake up at age 67, well, all of a sudden there's a million or two million dollars in that fund. So that works as well. For people who are somewhere in the middle, there are people who are willing to meet um, for an hourly fee. I, I know Living Smarter Jewish that was mentioned on Kosher Money has a number of people who will do that, who will sit down with you and kind of explain where to place things and where they should go to get them off on the right foot. And, and maybe from there they're okay to do it on their own or to manage that on their own. Let's talk taxes. Many people here have not received their first paycheck. Um, Josh gets his first job, he makes the first week $400, he gets his paycheck, opens it up, many young people think it's going to say $400, and then he opens it up and it says $237. What, what's happening there? Where's that money going? And how should people be thinking about taxes, especially for those that are not working for someone else and they're seeing the $400 from day one, but at the end of the year, they're looking at a tax bill. Firstly, it's important to remember that even if you're not working for someone else, you do have the legal obligation to report your income. So even if you are young and you are tutoring or babysitting, there is a requirement to report that income. I'll, I'll leave that there for now. Um, but taxes are a necessary evil um, or a necessary wonderful thing if you want your garbage picked up in the morning. It is important to remember, though, people do often get very excited. Oh, my God, I got a new job. I'm making $50,000 a year, and they've already spent the 50 in their money. Mind, um, it ain't going to be 50. Uh, it's not going to be close to 50, especially if you're single. Um, you're going to have very few deductions, and the higher your income... What's a deduction? A deduction is... Well, we don't have to get into that now, but a deduction is if you're married or if you own a home or if you have children, there are some reductions in your taxes. But as a single young individual, you are going to pay the highest bracket in whatever amount of money you're making generally. So if you are ma the more you make, the higher your tax rate goes. Um, you can look it up on something as simple as a smart tax calculator. Just Google it, and you can pull it right up to see. But that number is going to be, depending on how much you're making, pretty significant. So if you're making $50,000 a year, you're, you can expect to be giving at least 25% away. If you're making $100,000 a year, you can be expecting to give at least 35% away, and so on and so forth. Um, so it is very important if you're calculating, can I afford an apartment in the city? Can I afford to live with friends? Can I afford to have a car? Can I afford to make some other decisions or go on a trip to make sure that you're using your net income, which is simply after taxes, and not your pre-tax or gross income? would love to take some questions from the audience. I know we got a few questions about taxes, savings, investing. Uh, just stand up and state your name and Give it a shot. Hi, uh, my name is Arye. Um, I'm a little interested in like the difference between like just a regular credit account and a savings account. Like, how, what's the main difference between the two? Right. So you have a, a, a checking account yeah. and a savings account, and when you sign up, you walk into Chase or TD, and you walk out, you have a checkbook with a checking account, and then they also give you a savings account. But at the end of the day, the money in either is yours, and really, what's the difference? Um, so the difference is generally that the savings account is interest-bearing, means you will earn a very, right now, a very small amount of interest in that savings account, um, and generally, people will pay their bills out of a checking account. I do recommend that people have the two accounts. I think it's very healthy if you're spending $2,000 a month. Um, I'm assuming, obviously, a little bit later, not hopefully your months in Israel. That would be way too much 
if you're in that range, please come see me. I can give you a few tips and tricks. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, you're going to be in school or you're going to be living away from home, let's say it's $2,000 a month, you would want to put any money coming in, whether it's from parents or from a job or from any income stream into that checking account, and that's where your bills would get paid out of. The, saving, the savings account is where I recommend that clients put money that is not necessarily needed for that month's expenses, but could potentially be needed. So we talked, for example, about that first month in Israel or away from home at college and what it might look like. There are going to be expenses that you didn't think of. If you've got that money in savings, you could bring it over to checking. That being said, neither one is earning a ton of money, and the bulk of your money ultimately should not be in either of those accounts. That should be sort of enough to, to run your, your monthly living, um, and then other money should be, should be moved aside and invested. And now a word from Kolel Chabad. You know what I, I miss when I was younger? You used to have in yeshiva when you collected for your yeshiva they gave everyone a pushka a pushka a I, charity box yeah i miss having one of those well you're in luck in the show notes what you're gonna do after this episode in the middle of this episode while you're listening to this episode okay I'm doing you're it. gonna click on the link and you're gonna get your very own free pushka hmm. from kola chabad i want you to put it near your shabbos candles i want you to give it to your kid to walk around the block collect for israel's neediest it's a organization that's been around as you well know for over 200 years and i like having pushkas around the house it um it just shows that your kids that charity giving is something that's not just once in a while i was just telling a friend of mine and i said we're talking about my sir i'm like yeah because whatever we're talking about giving a tenth of your yeah and he money. said he said oh i don't give my sir and i said you really you don't and he's like no so i felt blessed that i before i even started working i put it in place to give my sir and this pushka from kol chabad is such a great way to teach kids that Yes, you want to go out and make money, but you also want to take some of that money and give it back to the world. And it's such a great opportunity to give back. When you get allowance, you give ten uh, percent to uh, to the pushka. Mm, I like that. We had Rabbi Kushner on a bunch of episodes ago, and he spoke about Meiser giving a tenth of your um, salary to charity. And ever since that episode, I've been giving my really ten percent. I was thinking I want to do like a whole episode and just my sir and like the beautiful stories. Yeah, he was saying how you think you're the giver, but you really end up receiving. Mm -hmm. And and he, and then I've seen it. The more you give, the more you get. So give to Kol Chabad. Go to the link in the show notes to get a little pushka, a little charity box. And now back to this week's episode. One of the questions we received ahead of time was student loans, right? Most of these folks here will be going to a college and college is costly, right? Many times parents do help out, though after college is up, people start their job and a good chunk of their paycheck is going towards uh, student loans. What should 12th graders know about college, student loans, uh, debt, and how should they be thinking about it? So again, the two words that I come back to are aware and deliberate. This is a very touchy topic. Um, if parents are able to pay for whatever school it may be, great, that's terrific, go, enjoy, awesome. If you are going to be taking out loans to pay for school, stop, pause, and think very carefully about what you're doing and why. If you're going to a, um, a private university that's expensive and it is a, uh, a very, very top school, but you know that you're going into a very high money-making field. So exa for example, if you know you're going into finance, let's use graduate school actually as a better example if that's okay. I have people all the time who are applying to law school and they ask me if they should be paying for private law school. It depends. If you've gotten into a top school and you are planning to go work for one of the big firms that are starting lawyers at $210,000 a year, you want to go to Harvard, NYU, I would probably say even if you need to borrow some of the money, it's probably worthwhile because it will have the trade-off. But I also see people all day long taking out tons of student loans to go into lower paying, albeit very wonderful fields, teaching, uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, things like that. 
or who go to law school to become a uh, public defender. Those are very noble causes, but you should look and see where you can go, even if it's not as great a school, that will cost you $15,000 a year with a little bit of scholarship instead of $70,000 a year. Because it will take you years and years and years to make back and pay off those loans, and it just doesn't add up. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense all the time. So be mindful of that if you're in that situation. Let's talk about budgeting. I know you have a budgeting worksheet that we can share with the students. How should people be thinking about budgeting, both as singles and, and God willing, once they get married? Um, do I really need to know how much I'm spending on clothing? Okay, some of it's luxury, but I need the clothing, right? I need food. Are you gonna tell me that when I go to the grocery store, I, I, I'm not, I shouldn't eat, right? I, I, Everything I'm taking out of this grocery store, I'm going to eat. So why should I be conscious of how much I'm spending at a grocery Let store? Let me ask a question to the, to the students. Do you think that budgeting is something that people need to do only if they have not, um, not high incomes available? In other words, should everyone have to budget or only people who have tighter budgets? Someone very wealthy, should they have a budget or is that just not necessary? Everybody oh. needs a budget. I don't care if you have a hundred million dollars. I don't care if you spend thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on clothing a year or food or anything else. It is critical and important for yourself to know where that money is going and how you're using your money. And I would venture to say that most people who are successful financially do have that type of a budget. Does it have to be down to the dollar the way somebody who maybe is living you know, month to month? No, but there has to be a general understanding and thought process that happens. So even somebody who is getting money from their parents and not spending their own money, I, I'm not saying this to change anything. Spend the month and track your expenses or look back at the last month. What did I spend? What did I spend on? Are those numbers I'm comfortable with? Are those numbers I can afford, my parents can afford, and that I want to continue forward with? Do it now so that at least when your parents look at you and say, how much do you need a month for Israel next year? You can look back and say, well, I've been spending X a month. I think I'll need Y a month or be ready for that adjustment. I think it is critical, even if you're not gonna change anything, to have that awareness of knowing exactly what's coming in and what's going out every month. Stacy, have you met with people that are making millions of dollars a year and then they come to you and they say, we don't know where our money's going. We don't know why we have almost nothing left in the bank. When you think about overspending, is that a real problem with people that are making a tremendous amount of money? I have clients regularly who, I don't know if I would say millions, but who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as a married couple, excuse me, or as a single, and who will come and say, we don't know where our money is going. And when we sit down, they can't estimate what they spend in a year on clothing. They need to look back. That's okay, you need to do that exercise. You have to have an idea of what it is you're spending, where that money is going, so that you can be aware and deliberate going forward. I have helped people fix their own financial situations simply by being aware of where the money is going and saying, wait a minute, we are, we are bleeding money on this front or on this front because we just weren't paying attention. While we were busy focusing on tuition, we, had, uh, we were spending on clothing. Or while we were busy spending, uh, you know, worrying about our mortgage, it turns out we go on three vacation. Whatever it is, everyone's got their own picture. Every couple, every family looks different. But you have to know where the money is going. It's got to be, you know. So... If you open up Instagram and go to Reels or TikTok, you'll sometimes get financial advice that says, you know, your Starbucks daily is costing you seven bucks. If you didn't spend that seven dollars after 10 years, you'd have $700,000, whatever it is. Is that practical, right? Should we be shutting down Starbucks? Should they feel guilty every time they get a cup of coffee? What is it that 
strikes people that, oh, oh my gosh, you're, you're, you're taking away my right. Starbucks. So everybody needs to know their station. <laughs> I once heard this question asked to a, 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 a rabbi's wife in the neighborhood, a well-known Rebetzin. Somebody said, if I have a lot of money, is it okay to decorate my sukkah for a lot of money each year, or is it wrong because it will make other people feel badly? And her very, very smart answer was, know your station. If you're a millionaire and you can afford to go to Starbucks every day, enjoy yourself. There's nothing wrong with spending money you have. It gets tricky when you're spending money you don't have. If you have a certain amount of money that you're earning and you're expected to save a little bit every month, every year, and you're not, I would start looking at anything I you know, would need to cut to make that happen. If you're okay to go, good for you. There's no, there's no rule that, that applies to everybody. You mentioned... Um a type of debt that you're okay with and you said when you buy a house it's okay to borrow money and then have a mortgage why is that okay and are you saying that there's good debt and bad debt um, so this this is gets a little bit trickier I am never ever unless there's literally a life in danger okay with credit card debt never there you you I have never yet seen other than that exact situation someone's child was in severe danger and they didn't have the money to pay for something that was the only time that I realized there was no choice other than using a credit card but when you look at people's um, Obviously, when you buy a house, most people don't have whatever the cost, certainly not the cost of a house in our neighborhoods or, or the tri-state area. People are not going to have the full amount available to pay for their home. So I would call that, in theory, uh, acceptable debt. I don't know if I want to call it good debt, but acceptable debt. You're doing it for a greater cause. The interest rates, although they're going up, are still relatively low comparatively to a, you know, to a credit card. And so I do think that that is an acceptable part of somebody life goal and, and achieving that and buying that house. Um, I do recommend that people try to pay off their mortgages uh, it, you know, as they're able to reduce that amount of debt once, they've, you know, once they are debt free in every other area. The question, the trickier question is really those student loans. That's when there's really a big disagreement with whether it's ever okay to go into debt. Um, as a as a from Jew, I am a big believer in higher education. I think it is very important for people. I think ultimately people earn more when they have that education. So there are situations in which if somebody can't pay for that education on their own, I would support paying for that education. Again, it gets tricky. Do I support paying for a city university or a state university? probably more than a private university unless there's some great trade-off uh, to having those loans. Let's talk about subscriptions. Has anyone here heard of Netflix? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. It's, it's, it, you'll hear about it if you haven't. Netflix every month will swipe someone's card $15, $16 these days. And then if you have Hulu, you know, it's another 12 bucks. If you're not careful, you could be looking at recurring fees every month in the hundreds of dollars just on subscriptions. When you sit down and meet with people, are people surprised about what they're spending on subscriptions or they know but they just choose to ignore it? So I think subscriptions in the scheme of things are not massive numbers, so they're not generally what tips the scale. If somebody has any sort of debt, it is something that I will pull out temporarily to get them to pay off their debt. I did recently, though, sign up for, you had recommended that true bill, mm -hmm. and I did it, and I found out that I was paying, I thought I was mooching all my subscriptions off my children, but it turned out I was paying for one myself, so we promptly canceled that one. I was paying eight ninety nine dollars for, I think, Prime Video, which I probably had because I have a prime, you know, card. But um, I think subscriptions is something that everyone just kind of needs to know what they have and make sure that they're using it. Gym is a big one. If you go to the gym and you use that gym and you go religiously every day or a few times a week, it's generally worthwhile. If you're not going to the gym and you're just paying for it, it's generally not worthwhile. So the subscriptions, I would say, if it's something that's really adding to your enjoyment or, or you know, your time, then, then it's probably something you can afford. But, but again, be mindful. Yeah, Truebill is a great app. It will basically look through all your credit cards and debit cards, and we'll put a link in the show notes, and tell you where you're spending money on subscriptions. Um, I had someone that was spending... He had Amazon Prime twice. He was spending, he, he didn't really, he had two different accounts, and 
we always say the, the packages didn't get there any more quickly because he had two, two, <laughs> two accounts. Uh, we do have a handful of minutes left, and we just wanted to take questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions for Stacy as it relates to money? Yeah. What's your name? Stand up and give it a shot. Uh, for student loans, let's say if like, I have to end up in college, right? Um, let's say if I don't pay it the next or the year after that, does the interest rate go up? So it, gener it depends what type of loans. I'm not an expert in student loans. Some loans start bearing interest, start, start accruing interest right away even while you're in school, and it's important to know which type of loan you have. Um, others for sure start um, accruing interest from when you graduate. So if there's generally a, mi a minimum that you're required to pay, if you're not employed, you can ask for um, an allowance of six months until you're working. There's, there, are other, there are other ways to do it where you keep the payment low. But generally, the assumption is, is that once you graduate, you are required to pay back a minimum amount each month starting immediately. And that interest starts accruing. And it keeps accruing. It just keeps going. So the sooner you can pay them off, the better. Yeah, Devorah, go ahead. Stand up. Yep. Yep. I there are a few that I like. I happen to budget myself on an Excel spreadsheet. I just got used to it, and I, I just see it. I'm very visual, so I like seeing it all out that way. The sheet that they have for you is an Excel spreadsheet. But I happen to like Mint.com very much. I like Dave Ramsey's app, which is Every Dollar. And there's a, a third one, the, the True Bill, that I like as well. And they're all free. You don't have to pay for them. So. And that gardening noise, you just hear gardening noise. I'm thinking, oh, I pay my gardener 140 <laughs> bucks a month. It comes out to $1,400 a year. Do I really need that? My neighbor doesn't really pay his gardener because he only comes a few times a year. You know, that's Your wife that's, said she'd like you to do the gardening. The gardening. Now, we'll pay the $140. But <laughs> I, I think that's what it comes down to, convenience versus um, the, the cost of having to do something yourself. Uh, we'll take one more question if anyone does have a question. And if not, we will head over. Oh, go ahead. What's your name? Michael. Michael, go ahead. Excellent question. Um, so I, if somebody is in a position where they are building credit, I think that it is it is okay, but again, once you're working, I don't think it's something you have to do at age 18 while you're a senior in high school. You will all start getting credit card offers immediately as soon as you graduate you're going to start getting the offers from don't 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 do them <laughs> um eventually once you are well, earning, it has their name on it it's cool yeah they, they always use their parents now they have their own yes so. they have their own that will be their own responsibility and their own debt um i do think it is okay once you're working to have one credit card where you use it where you use it for your month's purchases let's say you know you spend fifty dollars a week on groceries to put the groceries on the card and pay off that bill at the end of each month. Um, I think that is the best way to build credit. I don't think it is necessary to have multiple cards. I am against leasing cars. We can have that for another time. Part two. Um, yes, part two. But um, I think that is probably your fastest, easiest way as a young person to build some credit. Sometimes rent goes into that mix, but generally not. If you pay off your student loans in a timely fashion, that will build good credit. Um, Why is credit important in three sentences? The Why should only they reason care? credit is really important is to borrow money for things, which I'm only okay to do to buy a house. But nonetheless, I, I think it is good to have good credit to be able to buy a house. Right. The, the, the mortgage, the bankers are not going to love you when you have a credit score of 400 and you want to come buy a house. They're like, yeah. no, this person's reckless with their money. Okay, parting words. Assume that someone just slept through the entire episode they want to walk out of here with one thing. You have the ability to educate a hundred people here, many more listening on the live podcast. What should they think of when they think of, I remember in May 2022, I met with Stacy. a parting message, go. Everybody can do this. If it's not natural to you, don't be, don't be shy, don't be shocked. You can do this. It's not difficult. It's not complicated. Ask someone for help. Everything doesn't come naturally to everybody. I pay somebody to tell me to eat egg white omelets. Eat it, egg white omelets. Some she things are me. natural to me and are not natural to you. Even if you find this to be a scary topic, don't be scared off. Do a little something. If you've done nothing till now, choose one area. Say, I'm going to pay attention to what I spend on X. 
move in small ways and don't be afraid by the topic. Never be afraid to ask. I, I find that the only thing that's changed in all of my years of doing this and having a degree in a CFP and a degree in, in business, the only difference is I'm not shy to ask questions. I'm confident because I don't feel that there's something I'm supposed to know. So if I'm not sure, I'll ask. Do the same. It'll take you very far. One last thing before we go, if you can take out your phone. Head over to, if you have an iPhone, open up the podcast app and search Kosher Money. Uh, subscribe and hit five stars. It helps us in the ranking. I'm watching you. No and one's going to leave Instagram, the room. And my Instagram, Making oh, Sense yes. with Stacy. My children will be very happy yes. if you follow. What's that? Okay, making so. Making Sense, C-E-N-T-S. Sorry, Kosher Money No, first. no, no. We'll, we'll do Stacy. <laughs> Stacy's on Instagram. She's awesome. She drops these 60-second um, nuggets from time to time. Her Instagram handle is Making Sense. C E N T S with Stacy S T A C E Y. So make sure you follow her, and then on the podcast app, search Kosher Money, um, subscribe, hit five stars, and then we're also on YouTube. So if you do have YouTube, does anyone not have YouTube? Zero. They're doing such good things. Um, search up Kosher Money Living Lachaim channel. Subscribe there. And you'll see a whole bunch more of us and Stacy. Stacy has another episode with us, so look that up. Um, and we can't wait. We'll see you guys again soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of Kosher Money. We couldn't do it without you and our sponsors, Approved Funding. Dot com and kolelchabad.org. Please support our sponsors so we can provide you more content in the future. Many of you have been listening and many of you have been sharing and we can't thank you enough. So if you enjoyed this week's episode or any of our episodes, share them with friends and family. Hit those WhatsApp chats, hit those group chats, emails, call up your grandmother, tell them about us. People are listening on YouTube. They're watching on Spotify. We don't actually have videos up on Spotify, although that is uh, a feature that I've seen some podcasts have. But whatever platform you want to consume kosher money in, we're there. And we're doing some cool things. We're talking about some live events. Uh, We're big on YouTube, over 86,000 subscribers as of this recording. Many other podcasts we have inspiration for the nation we have spirit of the song we have that's an issue we have charlene amanoff's not a typical podcast with more on the way i saw about eight 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 episode eight podcast type of shows that yakov's uh, working on so that's really cool i'm excited for that we love your feedback so hit us up at living guest suggestions that is super important if you have a guest for us please let us know most of our guests these days come because of your suggestions i've spoken enough now i give you yakov langer who does like living l'chaim i love that part bye-bye guys living l'chaim